Ladies and gentlemen, I'm old. Now, some of you watching this right now might go, what are you talking about? You're like 28 years old. I don't know how you know my exact age, but I'm 28 years old. I feel old. Like sometimes my back hurts. Sometimes my brain hurts. Sometimes it's hard for me to uh, focus for a prolonged period of time. In any case, the average age of a top 100 chess player is 31. In general, in most sports, once you get into your mid to late 30s, you're sort of past the sport. It's very rare to participate in any high-level sport uh, past the age of 40. But in chess, we have a major exception. And the exception is none other than the absolute legend, five-time world chess champion, Vishwanathan Anand. He's 54 years old. When I'm 54, the world won't even exist. In 2050, nuclear meltdown, I don't know, something's going to happen. All right, I'm just looking forward to making it into my 30s first. This man is 54 years old. He's a five-time world champion and one of the best chess players in the world still. And in this video, I'm going to show you two games that he just played in the German Bundesliga. Many of you football fans obviously know about the Bundesliga. Bundesliga there exists also in chess. It's a team format. Vichy played an absolutely breathtaking game against Hikaru Nakamura. He played another breathtaking game against Nijad Abasov. Both of these players are playing in the candidates tournament to compete for a world chess championship. Just unbelievable stuff. Uh, also, I'm in Boston. Uh, I'm currently in a hotel room, and I'm here for the MIT Sloan uh, Analytics Conference. Shout out to anybody that I uh, saw there. I actually participated in chess boxing today, and yesterday I got to meet Luka Doncic. I uh, posted, actually, Luka Doncic got to meet me. I'm just kidding. I got to meet Luka Doncic, favorite basketball player, and um, we went to a Celtics game. It was very nice. Posted about it on social media, so... Um, Luke is a fan of chess. Let's start with this uh, game that Vichy played against Hikaru. And then I will show you this banger of a game that he played against Abasov. I really feel weird making Vichy content because Vichy content can be broken down into, damn, he old, but damn, he's good. <laughs> and I, I just kind of feel a little silly doing that. But like, Vichy play, Vichy's still like a number one ranked player in India. I mean, it's just unbelievable stuff. Um, so Hikaru opened with E4 against Vichy. E5, and Hikaru likes to take opponents out of a comfort zone uh, by playing this Four Knights. Four Knights is, is a pretty boring opening by, tr by the traditional sense, and um, Hikaru likes to play D4, and this leads to a very forcing line. Like, generally, if White wants to play D4, White will play it on the third move of the game and just go for a Scotch. Scotch is not like a critical line nowadays uh, for an advantage. It's generally Bishop C4 and Bishop to B5. Uh, but uh, Hikaru does it this way, which just takes people sort of out of a comfort zone that they might have studied. Now black plays bishop before. White takes on c6 before developing here. Now here's something slightly strange happens uh, sometimes where black will play d5, and then after white takes, uh, black will castle, opening up the second pawn for capture, but white's king is out in the open. It's not a big deal. We have takes, takes, and now we have h3, and we have this move c6. H3 is played to prevent anything from going to G4. C6 is played to strengthen the pawn in the center. And basically, Hikaru has played this position a handful of times. He actually used the four knights to defeat Fabiano Caruana uh, earlier in 2023 in a serious event. I believe it was the uh, Grand Swiss. He actually beat Fabiano with this opening to qualify for the candidates. Um, and the point is that white just gets some easy development. And it's a little bit difficult for black to move his pieces um, just, you know, he can't really make a whole lot of forward progress, so Vichy backs the bishop up to d6. Hikaru puts a rook, uh, in the center. You see all his pieces kind of out and about. He's barely using any time. And now Vichy plays this move knight d7. So he spends a considerable amount of time, and he brings the knight back, undeveloping it. It's a creative idea. Gets Hikaru out of prep. Hikaru thinks for 10 minutes on the next move. Black wants to reroute to c5 and e5, and he also just wants to trade the queen, because black is trying to neutralize white, right? So Hikaru plays bishop f4. Vichy puts the knight on c5, very nifty idea, this is defended, and he wants to trade off Hikaru's two bishops, and basically just play that middle game. Now, Hikaru, I really love his position, I mean, everything is perfect, knight, bishops, queen, strong, rooks in the center, uh, but Vichy just, you know, rook b8, puts the rook on the open file, just an improving move, asking Hikaru if he's going to play b3, he plays b3, and now queen f6, so the sides are clashing, right, this is chess kind of at its peak. Uh, Vichy weakens that pawn on b2, but he targets the knight on c3. He's not threatening to take it, by the way. It's actually defended, because the bishop can give a check, and then you would win the queen. This is called a uh, tactical defense. You're defending a piece tactically. You're not 
technically defending it, but you are because of this defensive resource. But black is threatening the bishop on f4, which is why Hikaru moves the knight from c3 to e2. And Vichy says, you know what, Hikaru, you want to you wanna mess around? I'm going to go use my lone pawn to kind of chop away at your position here. Big question for white is if you want to commit a pawn to a4. I don't really think so, because even though it freezes the pawn here and doesn't let the pawn come forward, when you play a4, it weakens the pawn on b3. And black can always capture, and if the rook can't take back, this is going to be very weak. So... Also, if you play a4, there's potentially something coming to b4 in a lot of lines. Like, maybe even now. Uh, so you got to be a little bit careful uh, if you're going to move a pawn to a4. So we have bishop takes, queen takes, and Hikaru plays c4. Just kind of trying to play energetically. You know, he got all his pieces out. So if you play energetically in chess, you got to, you know, you got to actually justify it. You got to do something about that. This she says, okay, well, it was always my idea to trade. Now Hikaru plays queen d3. And here I would argue is like the critical moment of the game. Everything Vichy's done has been good, but everything Hikaru's done has been a little bit better. And if anybody's got an advantage here, it's Hikaru. He's got significant pressure on that pawn on d5. And he's probably going to win it. Now, in a position when you're under pressure and there is a chance to trade pieces, pawns, queens, rooks, at the highest level of the game, you think the right way to simplify a position. You probably do the same in any sport. But in chess in particular, because there's going to be less pieces. Like in sports, people don't really come out of the game unless they get red cards. But, you know, even then you got nine, ten players. Um, or in, in hockey, you have power plays or whatever. But uh, penalty boxes in other sports. You know, you, you in chess, there are theoretical endgames. So Black is questioning, what's he going to trade? He plays a4. And I think what Vichy wants, Vichy's dream is a position where Hikaru will end up up a pawn, maybe. But Vichy's going to have considerable pressure, right? He gives him this pawn, says, Hikaru, you can take my pawn, but now this is going to be split. And I'm going to spend the rest of the game just hammering away at your doubled isolated pawns. Your advantage is kind of minimal. We have bishop a6, queen c3, which pins the pawn to the queen, therefore disabling the move bishop takes, because queen takes. Queen b4. So Vichy goes for a nice queen trade, and he's trying to basically say, look, Hikaru, if we trade queens and you try to win my pawn, right, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to play take, 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 rook d5, rook a4, and that's your extra pawn. And you'll go here, and I will go here, and you'll go here, and I'll play rook a8, and good luck ever moving your extra pawn. You know, and, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll also go bother your king. And that's what he's saying. He's saying you have an extra pawn, but you're never going to be able to move it because your rooks have to protect it. Even if you get your king over here, I'm going to just check you, etc. So Hikaru says, all right, let's go for all of that. Rook d5, rook a4, rook d2. He does it this way. Every good chess player at the highest level knows how to attack and knows how to defend. Just sometimes the attack is too powerful and the defense is, you know, it's, it's good, but it's hopeless. So we see Hikaru now, he's going to go to work. This is the best thing he could have gotten. He has this endgame. This is a very, very, very common endgame. Rook and three, rook and three with an outside pass pawn. Now, what's important is that you see how the rook is defending laterally? Well, if white had enough time to play rook d1, okay, and then rook a1, you see, this is a completely different story. This is probably holdable, but it completely depends on the position. Black has to play rook a3, first of all. You have to pre prevent white from playing a4. If white gets to play a4, white is now significantly closer to queening, and black has significantly less time to move away with the rook. But these endgames are always up for debate. Side defense is really bad. And now Hikaru is going to try to go to work. We see Vichy there. Look at that. Just throwing these pawns down the board to bulldoze them because he knows he needs to simplify the position. We have F3. He goes back to A4. Now Hikaru is doing everything right. He's going to kick that rook out. Look at this idea by Vichy. Sacrificing his H pawn. He's already down a pawn. He gives up another one. Allows Hikaru to bring the king even more forward, and then he takes the pawn on f3. So now Vichy is about to take the pawn on h3, but Hikaru's pawn is ready to go. But Vichy has calculated out that after a4, rook h3. You see, a4 is maybe the one serious winning idea. Uh, you got to be really careful here how you do this. All right? Do you have time to go here? I don't know, because I'm going to put the rook behind the pawn. But maybe, maybe you have enough time. f5 maybe, 
a5 king g6 a6 rook a shade a7 rook a8 and maybe 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 i'm fast enough right because if i go king d4 play f4 you run your king over there so it's very very close and vichy brings the rook down holds the pawn from a distance i mean this position looks hopeless this looks hopeless because white's rook protects this you stop the pawn from coming forward look how far away the king is and white is just going to push this is a complete nightmare but Vichy calculates this out, finds the only defensive move here. The only defensive idea. You might think here that black needs to come help the pawn push, so he would play king g6, but this is too slow. Let's say black plays king g5, h4 check, just pushes the king back, and that's it, you just win. You just play a6 and you know, you're completely winning. So Vichy finds rook f1, removing the eye from the pawn completely. Now white just pushes, but now black pushes. And the point is that black will now advance forward, force white to play defense against this pawn. And in that time, black is going to bring the king. And the second white's pawn gets to a7, you're going to bring the rook. a7, you're going to bring the rook. King b6, now the king's going to walk in. It's incredible. I mean, this position looks completely lost for black. Just visually, it just doesn't look like it's supposed to make any sense. But white is unable to do anything despite having pawns on the opposite ends of the board. And Vichy plays this out absolutely perfectly, threatening this pawn and this pawn and this pawn to come down and he holds this game this game goes a couple more moves and you know again some of you might be watching this going uh well why is this impressive by the way yeah hikaru the end there right we fight until kings why is this impressive this was just a draw boo, boo, boring no because again like the average age of a top 100 player is 31 like i'm, I'm telling y'all the stamina to play this game out, I mean, just at the ultra elite level, finding the only defensive resources uh, in a position to kind of hold, stabilize, uh, and uh, not, not find himself into, you know, in, in additional trouble is absurd. Like, he, he's so good. <laughs> and he makes it look effortless sometimes. Uh, and in the next game, he really made it look effortless. In the next game, my man Vichy was looking like, was looking like a guy we all know. Um, in this game, Vichy played Nijad Abbasov. As I was saying, Nijad Abbasov is a, uh, is a grandmaster from Azerbaijan. I think he's the third or fourth highest rated player in the country. And he qualified for the candidates by getting a really good result in the World Cup. Uh, in this game, Vichy went E4. Vichy's a lifelong E4 player. He plays open positions. He plays Spanishes. And uh, yeah, in this game, Vichy demonstrates... There's levels to this. Like, Vichy had to reach that high level to hold Hikaru off because Hikaru is the top three player in the world right now. But there's levels to this. So, Nijat plays c5, the Sicilian. Vichy plays knight f3. Nijat plays knight c6, probably looking for a Sveshnikov with knight f6 or maybe something else. Um, and Vichy plays here, the Rosalimo. The idea of the Rosalimo, quite simply, damage black structure or in certain positions, not do that at all and just sort of develop castle end up bringing the bishop back here, which you're going to see in this game. Black has a choice here. The main line is g6. After g6, generally white is capturing, although not always. Uh, but black plays e6. e6 is a little bit of an ugly move. Black loses control of the dark squares, but black wants to put a knight here, sort of blocking their own development, but basically saying, look, white, if you take my knight, it's going to be stupid because I'm going to take back with the knight, and, you know, I'm going to be in good shape. So we have castles, knight e7, Vichy plays rook e1, and basically this is saying, look, Black, you're stupid, because I'm not going to take the knight now. Instead, when you play a6, I'm going to bring my bishop back to f1, and then, you know, life is going to be good. Or I'm going to bring it here, put my pawn on c3, slide the bishop back, and then play d4. So there's a lot of these ideas. Uh, Abbasov plays b6. So Abbasov plays a move that has not been played in the Masters database uh, much. Like, it's... Uh, sorry. It, apologies. It hasn't been played much in the Masters database. It's not a very popular move. He plays this move. He's trying to get Vichy a little bit out of the comfort zone. Black has played many things here. B6 uh, is not a popular move. Vichy responds with the best move without even thinking. So he plays C3. Vichy understands the idea is to play D4. He's not going to move his bishop until his bishop is attacked. Now it's attacked. Now, what I found fascinating about this position is this position has been reached about 20 times in the Masters database. White has played Bishop A4. White has played Bishop back on this diagonal, and white has brought the bishop all the way home, like I just told you. Bishop a4 makes some sense, and it's a very much a baiting move, like you're baiting black into attacking you more. Vichy plays a move nobody's ever played before. 
So this man is still studying lines frequently. He has cutting edge preparation everywhere. He is constantly working on and evolving his chess. And it's just super cool to see that. So he plays bishop e2. Nobody has played this move yet in the master's database, and Stockfish evaluates it as the best move. It looks weird. What's the difference between bishop to f1 and bishop to e2? Well, bishop e2 blocks the rook, but I think the argument is that it isn't that big of a deal. I think the argument is that the bishop will go out to f3 if necessary. And on f1, it can't go out to f3 if necessary. That's just the whole point. So Vichy comes up with a very interesting idea. Uh, Abbasov now spends 16 minutes because he's never seen the move bishop to e2, which, I, you know, again, when you make Vichy content, it's kind of like this man has been at the elite level of chess for over 30 years. It's just a spectacle. Like, it's just... It's just very, very cool. Even if he's not playing as much, he's always got things up his sleeve. So pawn takes, uh, knight takes d5, and now Vichy plays d4, kind of showing the idea of white's position, just trying to open up the position a little bit. Black plays bishop e7, and Vichy takes his first thought of the game. Uh, essentially, after you get this far in any opening, and this is how I urge the advanced watchers uh, to think as well, you have to know the ideas. You don't always, you're not going to always remember the exact move at the exact moment. Like up until here, you could play on memory. Now you don't have memory, so you have to remember, what's the plan? Well, the plan actually for white is to play pawn takes c5, c4, and trade the queens. The computer evaluates the queen trade and the ensuing middle game, queenless middle game with all the pieces on the board, as the best option for white to play for an advantage because likely black will have to split their pawns. Say, why does black have to split their pawns? Why won't black play bishop takes c5? Well, they can, but then the bishop becomes a target. So it's actually almost better for black to split the pawns, get the open lines, than to take with the bishop. And that's what Vichy does. So he takes on c5. He, he thought for a little bit. He was probably contemplating c4 B, or dc. He takes, he plays c4, and he trades the queen. And um, life is good. Like, life is good here. He plays knight c3. Time for Abbasov to think. Um, the imbalance of the position, that's why I call it a queenless middle game, because there's a lot of pieces still on the board. Um, it's a middle game for sure. And the imbalance is in the pawns. Black has an e pawn, white has a b pawn. So white has what we call a queenside majority. And in any game, you're looking at the open squares and you're looking at the physical pieces, right? Things are unprotected. So bishop f3 ideas are on the table. Uh, advancement of the pawns is, is possible. Something landing on the d6 square would be very nice. Question of will black castle or does black even have to castle, right? So Abbasa plays knight d4. He goes for an immediate clarification of the position. However, that completely justifies Vichy's setup. Like, Vichy's entire plan of bishop here is now made possible. So his setup is fully justified. If black played, for example, um, bishop to c7, what would white have done? He would have targeted this pawn. And it's actually shockingly difficult to protect. Let's say black plays a passive move like knight d7. Well, white would apply more pressure. Now, if black defends himself like this, that's moving directly into the line of sight of these pieces, but also this guy would rotate and go there or there. And all of a sudden, black doesn't have sufficient defense on the pawn. So seeing all of that coming, Abbasov says, you know what, let's do something like this. But Vichy says, my brother, that is exactly why I put the bishop on e2, because now it goes out to f3, you have to move your rook, and I'm going to jump out here with my knight. And this clarification of knight d4 got rid of this weakness. But what did it do? Look at the structure. Now white has three on one. White just got a three on one. That's what white has. White has these three pawns and they're going to start moving. And that, might, that may prove decisive. That pawn imbalance might already be so strong as long as white stabilizes the position and doesn't do anything dumb, he's, the game plan is literally to push those pawns plus some other stuff. So Abbasov goes here. Vichy thinks... Brings his rook up, which this move looks so ridiculous to me. But if d3, you play rook e5, and the bishop has to go somewhere, and let's say it goes to b4, you would play a3, but if bishop d6, you would stop the pawn. So the pawn is just completely stuck, right? And if d3, d2, you would have taken the bishop. So here, 
now suddenly Vichy's advantage is growing. Because remember, in every endgame, Vichy's going to be much better because he's going to trade the pieces and win that pawn imbalance. So rook c7, rook e5, bishop b6, Vichy takes a pawn. So now that three on one is three on zero for half a move. And now it's two on zero. It's just two past pawns. It's just a matter of time. It is just a matter of time. Like, Vichy is going to try to go as fast as possible with these pawns. Okay? B3. The rook moves. Bishop D2. Abbasov gets a little bit closer. Vichy, principled man. Computer likes Bishop E1, for the record. It likes to just sit back. Vichy says, let me just get rid of these pieces. Like, how is Abbasov going to defend himself? Of course, the computer is a little bit more confident, right? Plays moves like King E7. But... It's two on zero. Like at the end of the day, a human being is going to really struggle to defend this position. If she plays knight before, Bossa plays rook c3. It would have been a little bit better to go all the way back with the rook. But he plays here. This is just waiting. He, he, he's waiting for the moment that he's going to start to unwind his position. He doesn't trade the rooks. But you might say, well, Levy, didn't you just tell me that trading pieces was good? Not if it's going to put you under pressure. You see, now black, white is playing defense. We don't want to play defense. We want to play offense. A4. Okay, bishop a6. B4. Yeah. Black is the one playing the offense. So we don't want to give black any offense. We want to put the pressure. G5. Desperation. Stopping any advancement. The king comes. Now it's time. B4. H5. A4. Now what's funny is, again, computer always somehow is more confident. It's like rook b6 and it finds all these different consolidation ways, but it's not going to work because once the pawns get rolling it's a wrap in this game rook b8 now it's a matter of are we going to push a pawn are we going to give a check we're going to push a pawn we're going to put the pawns like that why they blunt the bishop if you put a pawn on a5 all your advantage disappears because b5 immediately comes under fire and the point is that if you play b5 the move g4 has a lot less sting after take take and just casually sliding back you're on the defensive but only for a second. So bishop e8, getting the bishop out of the line of sight. Now Vichy just has to consolidate everything. King d5. King d5 is crazy. King d5 is crazy. He's bringing the king forward. So now Vichy says, all right, I can push my pawns, but what about this, what about this f3 move? Look at this. Now I'm trying to get my bishop into the game. Or I'm going to take with the pawn. I'm going to take with the pawn, bring my king, and I'm going to have some open lines over here. So he's got, the, he's got everything, right? The world is his oyster. Abbasov plays g3 suffocating the white king, not allowing the king to move. Vichy plays bishop f1. What was the idea of bishop f1? Why did he play bishop 2 f1? Like, what, why, why did he have to retreat? I mean, why couldn't he have just given a check or a rook b1? Well, he saw this coming. And he was like, what is black going to do if I just play bishop f1 right now? Well, he's going to play knight h5 anyway, but now this is a check. King goes to the middle. Rook e1, king f5. The king is getting walked along the rank. Apparently, you should have played defense with your rook here. But then I guess Vichy would have went knight d3 and he would have brought the rook back and Abbasa played here. And now Vichy's going to swarm the pawn while his queenside pawns are still there. Rook a8. The knight blocks the passage. The knight doesn't just block the passage. b6. White's king is safe. It's a little bit dangerous, but it's safe. And the bishop defends the knight from a distance. Perfect coordination. Everything is coordinating. Yes, this is a free pawn. But then I would play b7, b8. So black has to go here. Technically, he could play b7 anyway, by the way. He could have played b7. And after rook takes, he could have played bishop d3, bishop e4, just by the way. And if king g5, he could have played rook e5, king f4, rook e4, king f5, rook e6, e king g5, rook d5, f5, rook f5, king h4, rook e4, knight f4, rook f4, Vichy. I can't believe you didn't see checkmate in seven moves. Um, this is why chess is brutal, because we get to watch these games after and see these horrendous mistakes that these players are making. As a joke, b7, I told you those pawns are going to be decisive, and they just are. They just are. And the craziest thing about those pawns, and Abbasov resigned on the next move after 94, because Maid is threatened, you're losing another pawn, and this is still on the way. The craziest thing about all of this, like the way Vichy won this game, all of this was born from the opening idea. Like, the opening idea of bishop to e2 was designed to go here, ultimately move this knight, and put a bishop on f3. And the idea found itself 
right here. This was the whole point. Black's defensive idea to simplify and move the weakness into a strength completely backfired. White played in a way where the bishop was in a unique position. It was going to go to f3, and white was going to swarm this pawn on c5. Abbasov sensed that. He spent 10 minutes. He tried to clarify the position, and it played directly into Vichy's hands from the opening. He got the two on zero. He played a great game, and he won. And Abbasov is in the candidates. Like, and Hikaru is in the candidates. And my man Vichy is just, just putting on a show. Like, it's crazy to think we may have a grandmaster, knock on wood, knock on wood, in his 60s at the 2750 level. We're five years away, but it's exceptional. Like, I, I'm telling you, I feel old at 28. But she's like double my age almost. <laughs> it's like unbelievable. I play chess, I get tired. Like, he's just scrapping with the best players in the world and just beating them and drawing them and holding them, you know, defensively. It's just incredible stuff. Um, so when you make content about Vichy, yes, at this point it's like, wow, he's crushing it. But it's not just he's crushing it, but he's crushing it like 23 years above the average age of a top 100 player. Like, it's sensational. Gary Kasparov retired from chess when he was 42 years old, admittedly to go into politics, but... Would Gary have played when he was at this level at 54? Who knows? I mean, he still plays, but he doesn't play classical, so we'll never know. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, Anand's just, uh, just incredible, and um, I'll see you all back in New York City. Get out of here.